Hello, hello everyone. Um, so my name is Daniel, uh, but before I start, I have to make uh, three points, which actually will affect all my you know, presentation. So the first one is that I'm, I didn't have um, such an experience of a public talk in front of people for, um, I think, about half a year because of COVID-19 and all other things. So it may affect in a negative way my deliverance and how I speak to you. So please forgive me for that. The second point, which is really important as well, that I'm not an example that you have to follow in this case. In this case, I'm going to just uh, structureize everything that I know, and we will train with you how to perfectly deliver what you have to deliver. And the third point is important as well. I think that this presentation is made solidly for this workshop. So as you see there is a watermark IR, which means I'm rent. And I made everything which I know in this presentation. Hopefully it will help you to speak better and more structural. So uh, let's talk about myself. Who am I and who am I to teach you? Uh, so I had like eight years of public speaking and I, before to you know, deliver it more in depth, I would like to tell my first story, how I actually ruined everything and I found it really funny and decided that I should train myself and be better. So I was something about like 14 years old and I was in a conference when I had to deliver the answer to questions of other teams. And they asked me, and I stand up, and I have to deliver it in English. I had horrible English back in the days, like really, really bad. If you think that your English is not good, mine was like minus, you know, like minus, minus, minus 1,000 points to your. So I was like, I, you, Apple, hear me. So something on, on that level. And I had to answer some questions, like really in-depth questions about some EU policies. And I stand up, there's uh, my team helping me. They're writing small stickers, answer for me. I stand up, and all my stickers just fell. And I understand that, OK. Right now, I have to improvise in a way, and it was horrible. It was just a total disaster. I mean, I ruined everything. Uh, my, st my team wasn't really happy, but I decided that this is not enough for me. It's not enough to ruin you know, my, some, you know, my uh, career in this organization. I have to ruin, ruin it even more. So I decided that I should go on the stage and deliver an attack speech. So basically, there is a procedure in, in which you can go, and if you dislike other team work, you're going, you know, your work is really bad. I went there and ruined twice. After that, like, you know, after two really big fails, you would, you know, think that I have some fears, that I will, you know, work on myself. But no, for more than three years, I failed and failed and failed all the time miserably. And I decided that I should actually go and study a little bit. So I finished some courses. I finished like intensive course by Gustav Borichka. Actually, it's available in Kiev, I suppose. There is, they cost a lot, but it really will help you if you really want to study from a person who really knows how to deliver. I have Atlas Leadership Academy and nothing like that. So it helped me a lot in the end of the day. On the other hand, which is really important if we talk about Ayn Rand, about objectivism. I'm in freedom fight for a long time. For more than six years, I've helped establish other organizations. And I'm really proud that I was part of establishing Ayn Rand Center Ukraine as well. And hopefully, you will be the part of this organization in the future. So let's go why you really need the public speaking. There's a quote by Ayn Rand. You can read it over there. And it says that. She basically advocates free speech, even if the free speech will be used by Nazis and communists, which is eventually a really big part of a, if you fight for freedom, you fight for freedom for all people, even for Nazi and communists, unfortunately for all of us. But the good point is that their ideas, if we talk about um, free speech, will not stand for a long time. We, if we talk to each other, if we pursue each other, we convince each other, eventually the free market ideas will prevail and we will win in the end of the day. So if you really, for, for a question, why do I need, for example, if I'm an objectivist, why do I need you know, public speaking in a way? Because you have to persuade other people, you have to convince other people. And you have to fight for your ideas and you have to make your ideas sound. In that way, we're gonna talk about delivery. On this, particular lecture, I will not teach you rhetorics, I will not teach you argumentation, I will not teach you anything about delivery. Delivery is actually how you speak and, about, and not about actually what you speak. It con contains over five pillars, we're going to go in depth on each of them and I give some tips for you how to 
basically make it better how to become a better delivery, better deliver person. You, you deliver some ideas. Basically, uh, think about yourself as a, you know Uber Eats or Glovo or Bolt guy who goes and deliver food to people. But instead of food, you deliver them ideas, and you have to package them and you have to deliver them in a proper way for them to enjoy it. So, audibility. Basically, if no one hears you, you will not have any way to deliver anything. So, audibility is the first part. If you speak. It will not help in any way, right? So audibility, you have to be heard by other people. You can say whatever you want to, even some really crazy ideas or ideas that not doesn't, you know, coherent in a logical way. But if at least someone hear you, maybe it will, you know, convert to something better. As I said about my story in when I was 14 years old on some conference, I was clearly heard because I was loud, I was shining microphone, being really emotional, but it didn't really help you know, about other ideas and we'll talk about. So to be heard is like first and the most fundamental part. So how to make sure that others hear you? First of all, you have to fill the size of the room. So you have to understand what room we're talking about. For example, do we have echoes like here? So for example, if I say something, uh, should I understand that? Uh, even the, you know, the height of a ceiling, the material from which our wall are made, uh, anything like that can actually really be important if you're talking about public speaking. For example, I had, um, we had a conference back in the days in um, Kemda, you know, there's a huge building in the center of Kiev in the Stalin, Stalin Empire style, and it's like huge ceilings and uh, like concrete walls and a horrible echo. We didn't, we didn't actually, you know, saw that this could, could be a problem before we start conference, but when there were speakers were speaking in a microphone, the whole building was just eating all the sound. And you have to understand the size of the room. You have to understand how many people are in the room, the number of people. Because when I say to you, for example, it's not really important for me to shout, but if, for example, we have a crowd of people who are standing in silence, their bodies, their position will actually absorb the sound as well. So if I want to be heard, I want to be on the top, for example. I want to stand on something for people just to, you know, to see me. And it's really important why, you know, why people are delivering something from a stage because of the physics of a sound. Sound goes, you know, if, it, if I'm standing in a crowd and trying to say something, it will not end in anything. I have to be something above other people. So if you have a privilege as me to be a tall person, good for you because it may help you. If you don't have such a privilege, unfortunately, you have to find a way to be visible for other people and to be, you know, taller than other people. Uh, and, this, and the play with loudness is really important as well. For example, if I will talk really loudly all the time, it will make you not listen to me as well. Because if I'm loud, it makes you tired as well as if I'm, for example, quiet. If I speak really quietly, um, it's equally as bad as speaking loud all the time. So play with loudness, make sometimes voice a little bit, you know, shorter just to people pay attention, just lower your voice sometimes. And sometimes when you have, want to say something good and emotional, you have to go up and speak loudly. Good. Now, for example, people hear us, but how to engage them? how to make them actually not only, not only listen to you, not only hear to you, but to be engaged in what you say, believe in what you say as well. So engagement starts actually with the relevance of your topic. For example, I'm here talking about public speaking, but I will not uh, talk with you about, you know, I don't know, like farmland or agriculture or something, and I named my lecture public speaking, and then like for an hour I tell you about how I love cows. It's not relevant for you. Even if I speak about cows really passionately, it will you know, stick in your mind, I mean, for like 10 minutes, but then you will get bored because you'll get into details, how cows are good or bad, what the color of them, shapes of them, how wonderful they are. The other thing is actually ask other people. For example, if you're delivering in a lecture or if you're doing a workshop, try to engage them in a way that they will have to do something, you know, just ask other people. So what do you think about this particular picture? What do you think about what I just said? Maybe you should throw something controversial that people will say, no, this is not okay at all and I want to disagree. It will make them engaged as well. Receive feedback, it's always important. I mean, by receiving feedback, there are two types of feedback, verbal and inverbal. Verbal is like really obvious one, you just ask people, so how did you feel about my lecture today? And they say, ah, Daniel, you know, it was horrible. I said, okay, fine, good, good, 
bad for me, I think bad for you, we lost time with each other. And there is like inverbal feedback, which basically you see how people react to what you say. Do they actually listen? Do they sit in their phone? Do they think, are they going to go to some restaurant and you know, have some good time after a lecture? Or do they feel uncomfortable, for example? It's like inverbal feedback. And please, you have to understand that as well. And it's really depressing that if all inverbal, inverbal feedback in your room is bad for you, like not positive. You've seen the people just sitting, you know, not, not having a really great time listening to you. So all the time understand about feedback. So now they're engaged. How we convince them, how the, we make them to believe us. For example, they are listening, they can hear us. I come here from, a, um, I don't know, like a, some organization like Ecodia or something. I'm here to convince you that cutting trees are not okay. Maybe you're listening to me because I'm, you know, I'm loud, I'm standing a bit, little bit taller than you. Um, we have another really big room, we can talk, we can share, you are actually engaged. But how do I convince you that cutting trees is not okay? So, first of all, what I have to do, believe in a way and act. If, if you don't believe, for example, you, well, I don't, the university said you have to make this public speech and just try to fake it as hard as possible. Think about some small story inside your head that, that will convince you that this idea is really important right now. For example, the cows are really important and agriculture is essential to Ukraine for, because of centuries and blah, blah, blah. So believe in what you say. Tell stories, not only facts. It's important as well. And as, as you can see from this quote, which is really long, and by Ayn Rand from her basic principles of literature, actually really good essay if you want to uh, understand a little bit more how to write. And basically what she's saying right there is she's saying that um, if you try to put something really good inside a book, you have to have the story that covers it. And at the same time, if you have the story, it should be as you know, be on the same level as what you're trying to say. For example, I cannot explain some metaphysics saying like boy meets girls, it will not work, for example. But if I do something really hard, I create my personalities, I develop their characters, at the same time, these people can carry my hard story. So, tell the stories and tr try to tell them in a such way that you have balance between some really hard topics like metaphysical one and the people who delivers it or like, I don't know, animals or symbols or spirits, whatever, in your story have to be on the level that people will believe in that story. For example, if we come to example with a nature and lumberjacks, you will not believe in a story delivered from some guy who, li who lived all his life in the desert about how important, for example, not cutting trees because he didn't see, tr he didn't see trees in his life like any time, okay? But at the same time, if you say this guy, he's living in a desert and he saw the forest and he come back and he understood that his desert is created by horrible and mean guys who are cutting trees down. That this sto his story is about that cutting trees is not okay, and now he's delivering his speech, he believes in what he say, and he tells his story that he was in, he lived for all his life in desert, then come to forest, then come to back to desert, and now he believes that trees are important because desert is not as, as cool as forest. So make sure that the whole thing is sticks up and work on your messaging. I really love this quote, which is actually sums up all whole objectives for me personally, to say, I love you, one must know first how to say the I. So it's really, really whole Ayn Rand philosophy, okay? To say I love you, you have to start with I, which is goes egoism inside it. We go like anti-altruism, understanding of love, her understanding of love itself. So the reason, because it's structured in a logical way. So this message is really you know, it's a stick, so it sticks around. It's all her philosophy is about. So work on your messaging. So if you want to convince other people, work on your messaging and don't try to convince them about everything. Just focus on some specific topics. There's, um, I don't have a marker, so anyway. So there's, a, there's a, a theory that you should give only three main key points and hopefully people will remember one. From your, from your speech. So if you want to, if you speak like, you know, to the huge audience, hopefully they will remember something that you want them to remember, but actually there are huge risks that will, they will remember only something that's not essential, for example. Um, recent example, there was debates between vice presidents in uh, the United States, uh, and there was one vice president who had like fly on his forehead for like about six minutes. And nobody actually remembered what he was talking about. Everybody was remembering the fly on his forehead.
So, you know, sometimes you don't have uh, actually a power of what will people remember about your speech. But please, if you want to make some message, work on it really hard. So now people are convinced, maybe, or maybe not. To convince people, like, you know, finally, you have to have the authority to speak. Uh, to have the authority, you have to be confident or look like a confident person. It's a really important thing because all of us are afraid of public speaking. There's a numerous resource, you have to Google it, but as far as I know, the pub fear of public speaking is like the second after the fear of death. So we have like fear of death over here, we have public speaking here, and all evil sharks and stuff that you hate or fear over here. So it's really you know, hard and uh, scary thing to do, but you have to you know, look like a confident person. You have to posture yourself like a confident person, speak freely, try to fake it till you make it. The only way to do it is, unfortunately, to speak up. You cannot train confidence inside of your room. You have to go and speak to other people and train it and train it and train it. And hopefully someday you will look like a confident person. Fight with your fears. There's a story I would like to share with you. That actually, if you're nervous, this story really helps me to bring me back to reality. Because being nervous is, okay, I have to tell the story first and then I'll explain it uh, in depth. So the trolley bus story. Imagine yourself, you're standing on a, a trolley bus stop and you're looking on a schedule and trolley bus is already late for five minutes. And you're starting nervous because in your brain, Trolley bus is, will be late more than five minutes, it will be like late in 20 minutes, you'll be late to your work, on your work, or like university, in work university, you will be uh, shouted on by evil uh, teacher or a boss because you're late again, and at the same time you will feel yourself miserable and horrible because other people will say that you're always late all the time, they will blame you, and next time when you are on time, they will blame you as well because you was late and blah, 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 as goes on. So the main logical, logical problem here, you are still not late on your work. And the trolley bus is late only on five minutes. It's not a huge deal. It's like five minutes trolley bus. And you have to bring yourself back into reality because your brain is already over there. Your brain is standing in position when you're already late on the work, when you have problem with your boss, when you have problem with other people working there. So your brain is already nervous about something that not, not even happened. So something that will maybe or may not happen in the future. So to put yourself in a position not to feel nervous, you understand, okay, right now I'm nervous in uh, delivering a speech because I believe that I may make a mistake. That mistake will be understood by other people and they will judge me and I will fail my speech. So you write in the future. You're not in a position and you say, okay, okay, wait for it. I'm, I didn't deliver my speech yet. I haven't delivered my speech yet. I will deliver my speech in like, you know, 10 minutes and hopefully it will go good or not good. I don't understand. But for me, it's really important to be in that particular reality. What I do when I'm nervous, for example, I have like important meeting and I'm nervous and I'm thinking, okay, what is my brain trying to say me? And my brain trying to say me that this meeting will be failed or I will lose my time or it will not be as efficient as I thought. And I put him, no, no, I'm not in a meeting yet. I'm in a taxi going to this meeting I'm here, I shouldn't be nervous because nothing happened yet. So the whole nervous thing is actually think about something that didn't, that will or will not happen. So all the time, try to put yourself in the shoes of standing right here and right now. The second thing is how to fight with your fears. If you, if you think about um, physiological uh, side of a fear of a public speaking, you have to understand that this comes really close to excitement. Because when we are excited, for example, we have our hands sweating, we have a trembling, we have adrenaline all over in our blood. The same, actually, when you feel fear. So try to convince yourself, no, I'm not afraid right now, I'm excited. Because all these people come here and have like losing their time to listen for me. Even if I don't have something really good to deliver, I will do my best because these people are here to listen to me. And they don't have any you know, bad agenda to throw some tomatoes inside, uh, like inside my face or something. They have something good. They come here to listen to me. So try to convince yourself that I'm not afraid. I'm actually excited. And stand on the ground that you can defend. So 
uh, in the philosophy, who is it? Uh, basically, Rand says that we have all the good things are joined by people on not on just on the belief, but on the reason. And at the same time, you always have to stand on the ground that you can defend. For example, if I throw something that, for example, I don't know, Russia should you know, conquer all Ukraine, from my position right now, is undefendable. Because, you know, first of all, I don't believe in that. And secondly, it's really hard to defend in any way. Or for example, I should, we will do actually exercise on that one. But for example, all of us should you know, ban, I don't know, like, markers to the whiteboards, but at the same time have whiteboards. So it's undefensible position from a all different perspectives and just don't go there. Um, I was listening that other speaker were saying about the child laborhood, it's just, oh, whoa, 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 that's, that's a really hard thing to defend, you know? I will not go there. Maybe uh, secretly I'm a fan of child labor, right? But I will not go there in public and speak about it because it's really hard to defend. I mean, who you have to be to say, you know, I have a five years old girl, maybe it's okay for her to work in a huge factory, you know, where is there a risk or, or for her to die, to die or something? No, it's really an undefensible position. So I will not go there, for example. But at the same time, I will stand on the ground that capitalism actually made our life better. And I can defend this. I have data, I have arguments, I, ha I actually, I have been advocating this thing for almost six years right now. So I have everything to protect this ground, but I will not protect the ground of a child raper. So the last one, I think there's likability. You can say it connection with the audience or likability. Will the people like you from a start that you actually go into room because it's really important, your first impression, everything like that, like likability, it's really interesting, it's really hard to measure in a way because for example, for some people, uh, uh, a new elected president in the United States of America, Biden, is really likable because of something. For me personally, he is not likable because I just don't like how he looks, how he tells. Maybe he's a good person, but at the same time, yeah, he has really low likability for me. So how to build your likability, how to make people like you in a way? So first of all, you have to be positive. It's really important. I mean, if even if you... Okay, there is some uh, context in which you shouldn't go and be positive, like funeral, for example, or something like that. But in all other topics, I think be, being positive is just a good thing to have. I mean, being positive to about everything around. Develop your style. It's a really good quote by um, Ayn Rand, actually. There is a beauty, a sense of harmony. And it uh, goes from uh, antique Greece, where they believe that the beautiful something, it's the, okay, the object is beautiful whenever it fulfills its purpose. So for example, if you have beautiful chair, it should be comfortable. It should be comfortable and should fulfill the first obligatory thing for chair for people to sit on it. If the chair doesn't you know, stand properly, it falls down, even if it's made of gold, it will not actually be beautiful in the standard of ancient Greeks. And at the same time, it's here, so your sense, how you look, how you, how you present yourself, what you wear, uh, you know, your style, it should be in harmony in a way. Uh, for example, and it should resemble who you really are, and it's really hard to think, and there are people are earning like thousands and thousands of dollars on like giving a good consultations on how you should look, and politicians all the time try to look in a way for them to, you know, just person comes into room and you have some impression of this person if you didn't see this person before. So you have to develop your style and I'm here will not help you to do that because it's really your work with how, which is harmonizing you, how you look in your opinion, opinion of other people, beautiful or ugly, and which combines with what. For example, for a real long period of time, I was and um, still is a huge fan of bow ties, for example. But whenever I have a beard and combining with a bow tie, it makes me look like uh, some really hipsterish guy, which will not work uh, in the conditions that I'm work. So I will not, uh, as long as I have a beard, I will not wear a bow tie, for example. Other, like the last point is being organic. Being organic is really important. For example, if you try to convince someone and you're standing like all covered, you know, in a suit in the mud, for example, and you tell the villagers that they have to support free market, maybe it will not work. Or maybe it will, I don't know. But at the same time, you have to look organic in a way. And this thing is actually, there's a 
new uh, definition that's named new organic, which makes, for example, uh, you know, when you see Trump wearing his like hat, like coal miner hat, in uh, like coal, when there's coal miners around him, and he doesn't look <laughs> not even like a person who ever been in coal mine factory. He looks like a person who doesn't know how to wear it properly because you know it sticks all the time. But in the same time, coal miners love him. And it's named like new organic where, you know, parts are not stick together, but at the same time, it's all, all around it's like beautiful thing. And it's really interesting how it will transform new politicians and new, you know, new ways of understanding how to be organic and new, you know, maybe new public speakers. So it's really interesting. And last two, I think, is the hardest points in the whole presentation. So if you can work, you can train, you can watch videos on YouTube about everything that was stated before, but last two is unfortunately on your own. You have to develop it on your own. I will, can you deliver the, the sheets of paper? We're gonna do um, uh, actually the, the some practical uh, actually exercise down here. I will ask you first of all to read it to yourself, not out loud. And the first exercise called Mama Moo. So you have emotions on papers, like the first one, like Mama Mu, and there's a, a thing, there's emotions, an energetic or sad or something like that, there's one word, emotion. And you have to deliver the speech containing only from three words, Ma, Ma, and Mu. And all of us have to understand what your emotions are. For example, I've received the paper in which you're written that my emotions are sad. For example, I'm sad cow, and I have to say, Ma, Ma, Mu. And I have to deliver to all of you, and all of us have to guess what actually you are saying and what your emotion is. It's going to be like first, and it's really important. I will explain why we're doing that after we finish with it. So, is there any volunteer who would like to give the Mama Moo speech to all of us? Good, good. Come here, please. Is your stage right now? And we will have to guess what is your emotion is. Okay. What can be? Any suggestions? Angry. Angry. Okay. Any other? Not so. Okay, okay, okay. And when, whenever you hear uh, the proper answer, you should say, yes, it was. Yeah, it's just like dissatisfaction, it's uh, disgust. Disgust, like mama moo. Mama moo. Thank you so much. Have applause. Um, anyone else? It's not so hard. Is it hard? Was it hard? No, it was funny. It was funny. Cool. Anyone else? All of us have to go through it, unfortunately, for all of us. I think Anton can help me with that, please. Can I? Yes, you can help me. You saved him. Good for you. You're a hero right now. Okay. Mama Moo. Mama Moo Moo. Mama Moo. Mama Moo. You can try maybe another time. Maybe like, maybe okay, another way. Yeah. No, 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 go right here, right here, <laughs> right here, in other way, maybe. Oh. <laughs> come on, come on, give it another shot. We believe in you. Positive? What was it? Yeah, it's, it's quite... Okay, let's, let's think about it. Yep. Mama Moo. <laughs> okay, what was it? What was it? Happy. I was happy. Oh, huh. it was happy. Thank you so much. Come on, come on. I think it's not so hard. So, I'm I'm back here. Yes, it is. It is. Good, 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 good. The first one. Thank you so much, Anton. Anyone else? Come on. 
So it's not that hard as well. Thank you. Sad. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> cool. Cool. It was it was easy. Thank you so much. Uh, maybe you, maybe you. Good. Yeah, good, 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 good. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay, you can tell. What was it? In love. Aww. <laughs> It's it's your it's it's your way of expressing love. Good, good, good. Yeah, sure. If you would like to, why not? <laughs> Communist. <laughs> good, good, good. And the last, but definitely not the least. <laughs> so what was it? Fear. It was fear. Cool, cool. So what was the idea of it actually? It was the idea that you can have a different tones of your voice and different emotions even if there is nothing actually to deliver. Because if you think from a logical perspective, what actually would it say right now? Like what, what new information was delivered? Nothing. But through emotions we delivered something. We said that, for example, right now I'm sad, right now I'm scared, right now I feel disgust. And if you deliver something, you have to actually use these tools, tools of your own voice. Next one, which is we're going to talk about uh, defending devil, basically. You have on your sheets of paper the undefensible ethical position. You can read, you can read them to your own. And uh, then I will ask you to present like one minute speech that you will do your best to convince all of us that your undefensible ethical position is really good. It's undefensible from different perspectives. Some of you have received something which is actually means uh, you know, something really stupid. Or you have received something that actually actually adult evil thing to advocate, for example, like, you know, eat your children or something like that. And you have to defend it, like, in front of all of us, like, for one minute speech. And you have, I think I'll give it, like, five minutes to prepare it. And then we're going to uh, give the speech and maybe give some feedbacks and possible outcomes and, like, help to help you in next time to be more convincing in uh, public speaking. So five minutes for you to write the speech down. It will help you, I think. Or if you don't need to write it down, you can just remember it and try not to forget your arguments uh, when you deliver the speech. So five minutes starts right now. Yeah, you can, you can, you should, I think, combine it, but no, 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 it's not obligatory. So, for example, if you're, for example, was teacher, it's not obligatory for you to deliver the speech. It's like different task. But if you want to, it's, it's okay. But your main objective down here is to convince other people that sh they should, hmm, maybe it's not a, such a crazy idea to have this, you know?
you have one minute to go. Okay, time is up. Anyone who is ready to do, deliver the undefensible ethical position to all of us? Yeah, but yeah, you can go here. But before you start your speech, you have to read your position to all of us. So what is before? Before, before, before. Okay. yes. Good, good. Uh, and any, my suggestion would be that the, the thing with the beautiful eyes was really good. So when you said that zebra is looking at you, and you, sh you have to like two arguments. First one was that this in inequality that only horses are carrying people, which actually can be good as well because you go through ethics and you say, hello folks, it's not okay to only for horse to work to it. And, but second was, was that we have to domesticate them because it's bad for them to be in wildlife and it would be good for you to, do, to you know, deliver it in other way. For example, you say it's not okay that only horses are having all this pri you know, privilege to be like, domesticated by humans. And then you say zebras are cool animals too, why they are not domesticated, they're feeling bad and in, like, in nature they can be like, eaten by a lion or something like that. So you have to build up, not to create a sec, you know, separate argument. But it was good. It was good in a Thank you so much. Anyone else? Cool. Anton. We should give alcohol to soldiers for sleep. Number two, cause of death in the air. We tried 
cool. <laughs> I'm actually right now a fan of this policy. I mean, I think I wish maybe there's something inside it. This was a really good because he started at uh, something that's named the common base building. It's one, for example, so has anyone had this in their life? And then, for example, ask some question. You know, like has, for example, you experienced being drunk? I said, mm, yeah, maybe. And he, some you have this connection with a person. So he started that everyone has some addictions, which is really strong statement because it's true. And then he's trying to build false statements on it for example that we have to you know give toddlers alcohol because it will benefit them not destroy them you know it will be good because it will be teached from like early childhood that alcohol is something you have to be aware of which is really building up your false statement on something that was actually was true and it's like wonderful example of manipulation if you want to manipulate someone go with it start with something true and then you know enhance something which is really untrue on top of it so it's really really cool thank you uh, Toddlers like really small children, like like under like five years old or something. They go to kindergarten, so they will have alcohol, you know, for free, which is, which is cool. So, uh, <laughs> any, anyone else who would like to deliver a speech? Don't be afraid. We will. Yeah, please. Thank you, thank you, cool. So um, the thing is that um, you advocated that shorts are cool, which is good for a statement, but you spend lots of time on advocating on the shorts. But while your objective was Fridays, Wednesdays, and because it's like the most you know, ridiculous part of it. I mean, wearing shorts is maybe, you can defend it in a way, but only three days in a week, which is basically obligatory for everyone to wear them, you had to focus more on that. And you did it in the last one, you said that Aristotle told something, that you have to wear the shorts, which is healthy. It's called calling the authority. When you say, for example, my granddad once said God will destroy all Democrats. And you, and you go with that, it's, you know, there's a, your actually uncle is the smartest person in the room, and you build all your positions. Same time, and you, maybe you should try to work as well on building something that is common to people. And you said everyone wears it and it's healthy. So the argument with healthiness can better work if you say about statistics, for example, not Aristotle, because Aristotle is something that we believe that he has wisdom, has some you know, basic knowledge of everything, but at the same time, he doesn't know much about good medicine. But World Health Organization, for example, does. And you say, you know, World Health Organization you know, did some research which showed that wearing shorts is reducing your possibility of your heart attack by 10%, for example, which sounds maybe ridiculous, but at the same time, you know, we heard a lot of statistics all the time, which most of them are actually untrue or manipulative in a way. Uh, actually, a good example of it is that um, 
there's uh, uh, really controversial studies of uh, wine drinking and uh, coffee drinking. So if you go and say, for example, drinking a cup of coffee will reduce your heart attack uh, risk, and there is a recent research that say it actually will increase your heart attack risk. And all depends, all the time there are different researchers and they don't have really a common ground what is actually true is. And at the same time with one glass of wine, I, I think you heard it that you know, drinking one glass of good red wine a day will not make you unhealthy, it will make you even healthier because it will do something with your heart, with your blood, or something like that. But recent research said that it may be actually causing more people to die or not. Actually, there's a huge problem with that. So you can use some state statistics, grab it, and throw it all around you know, the people and saying that this is the most true statistic that you ever found. And nobody will go into details. Nobody will see that it was you know, calculated by some three rednecks in Indiana, for example. And, it's not that, and they say that the Earth is flat. And there's a huge number of people who believe that the Earth is flat. And they have their own statistics, their own science, and their own scientific community. So find statistics that support your ground and this really good good deliverance was over there. Thank you so much. Anyone else? Yes. Imagine what it feels like to you. So don't feel um, you hate your friends or relatives or everybody else because this is just the, the way to show them how you appreciate them. So let's do it. Let's do this job. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I really liked it how you played with your voice timbre and you lowered it, you know, just to sound like a soft, cuddly little kitten who talks. La. Yes, yes, it was really good. What I'm saying it was really good. And the whole idea that, you know, your speech was more emotional than like database, which is obvious, <laughs> but it was really good. I'm, I'm really glad that you played with your voice and it helps all the time. And it's actually, if we talk about if you talk about uh, not authority, but it was more about conviction and more in a way that actually he was believing in what he was saying because he felt sad and now he like wanted to transmit his love to other people for them to be not suicidal. So, anyone else? Please. Backwards, right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Cool. 
so the, the main idea was to be individual, to be uh, not as all other people. And maybe in, in the future you should uh, deliver some story about some guy who was unhappy because he was wearing pants like that way and because of some issues, you know, in his health or something like that. And then he was starting was backwards. It opened a new way for him. And he started to teaching the way of wearing pants backwards to other people. And you was one of these folks who was listening to him. And right now you're a huge evangelical of wearing pants, you know, backwards. And just in, in the future, just a small, you know, it's, it's a huge problem for me right now, like for a really huge problem in public speaking, is keeping eye contact with other folks. I mean, they all the time say that, and they say, you know, it's so easy, just look other people in the eye. But when you're actually thinking and you're reading something and you're thinking how to deliver properly, it will be really hard for you to keep the eye contact. So my suggestion, if, for example, how I actually solve this problem, I choose one, if you have like big audi auditorium, I choose one, to three people, like one here, one there, uh, on the right, and one in the backyard. And I like have eye contact with them for something about like half a minute. And then I go and change, you know, subjects, uh, and I change subjects where I have eye contact. It's really hard to, you know, have eye contact with a person who you don't know, for example, you haven't, didn't ever met, and you just see, see in a person. And it's really important for people to actually be connected to you because people want to be, you know, seen. They want to have eye contact. And then eventually you will find yourself in a position that some people will say, some people will believe you and say, yeah, definitely, we should ban chocolate. Because actually it's what happened with alcohol in the United States of America, like Anton um, reminded us about that at the time, there was a huge like social hysteria where people was believing that the one dose of alcohol can kill a horse or something and were like drinking it all the time. And the drunk people are driving on the streets and are killing, they're the massive, they're like manipulating with all over the things like static, statistics, like stories like mothers crying and said, we have to ban it. So there was huge campaign, which eventually ended up in a you know, really bad thing because uh, ban on alcohol created a horrible mafia. Like Al Capone, the main sources of his money was not even drugs, but illegal alcohol. So this actually can work and it can, you know, churn mountains if you build it perfectly. So yeah, thank you so much for, for deliverance. Please. Thank you. It was really good. What I, my suggestion would be, uh, actually, I, I gave this um, this topic to another person back back in the days, were like doing the, and doing the, my debates career, and there was a team who actually showed that squirrels can rebel. So one day, squirrels, like there are millions of squirrels on the planet, 
and if we will not give them this small thing as a citizenship, they will rebel and kill all of us. Other than that point was that actually squirrels are not as stupid as you believe, and they were like, you know, doing state and showing like slides, or squirrels are really smart. And if we're talking about voting for president, like they were like showing there in this electoral polls that squirrels will vote, for example, for Poroshenko instead of like Zelensky because Poroshenko cared for forest or something. And they were like doing like these old things, and in the end of the day, you okay, okay, maybe, maybe we should give something to squirrels. So uh, believe in what you're saying, it was really good because you were saying that I have bro, and it was really sad that he still doesn't have this citizenship, and it's really inequality. And in a way, what you had to actually show there, my suggestion would be to show that actually squirrels are not only donating something to international fund, they are doing our forests, because it's true that squirrels are carrying their stuff, they're like digging it in, in, the, in the holes, and then they forget about it. And eventually, like in one year, the tree will grow in this place, you know? So squirrels basically are planting new forests and like helping whole planet, and still they don't have anything from humans who are like cutting their trees and something like that. So it was really good. Thank you so much. And we have another one, right? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, the thing is, I would say about Kenya, it's a really hard topic to protect, but in the same time, it was really good what you were saying about corruption. But then it was felt that you asked the question, are you agree with me? Which showed in some way you're a little bit, you know, un in confidence in your own statement. So never do it. Even if it's like stupid thing as giving like citizen to squirrels or something, or something evil as giving alcohol to toddlers, show that you believe in what you say, as we said. If it's like, it will, for sure, it will destroy corruption. Why? And you, maybe you will say something, they will have an argument, but people will remember that you are confident, at least, even if your argument is, you know, not really relevant to them. Uh, another one about the whole argumentation system, uh, it's really important to go, I'll, I'll, it was the last thing I will, gi I will give you, the tip. If you have, uh, you know, some, to convince someone and you have tried to build something logical, go with three arguments. The first one should be uh, middle, middle power, you know, like middle power argument, for example, not really as, as hard as possible. The, the second one should be really the, you know, the weakest point. So your weakest argument you put on the second place. And the third one should be the hardest one because people will be interested from the first thing, they maybe will disagree with, with the second thing, but the third thing will close it, and at the end of the day you will have person convinced by your thought. So middle, low, and up. Go like this, and it will actually will eventually make people more involved in what you say. So, uh, thank you so much for deliverance. I would like to say that even if you didn't have a lot of experience before, it's a huge step for you that you talk to other people, to these folks. And it's not really a huge difference between delivering something to like eight people or 800. Because the thing is, when you have 800, it's even better because you will not shake all hands with them and you will not have this awkward moments with a coffee break, for example, or when you know all of us, all of you will have a possibility to ask some really hard question for me. But at the same time, when you talk, the principle is the same. 
People came here to listen to you. You should be excited. And the second one, nothing actually bad happened yet. So don't be afraid of it before it actually happens. You should be afraid of it when it's, you know, when it's done and then it will, hopefully it will turn you in other better person. So if you still need help, there is my email, there is my uh, phone number which is connected to my Telegram. So if you, have, uh, if you would like to receive some uh, maybe links to the workshop that was talking about, about the Gustav Vodishka, of, or if you want to receive some books that they have about public speaking, just email me or text me through Telegram. I would be happy to share them. And I have, like Dmitro has all my contacts. I actually, Oh, a big part of you already. So thank you f so much for your time, for your effort, for your mama moose, and your for indispensable statement. Thank you.